It's so good to see you today. We, uh, we do have our committee meeting this afternoon. We do not have baptism this morning. We got to remember to turn all that stuff off if we hadn't already. So remind me about that, whoever heard that and understands what I mean. Um, I want to talk to you about being saved by hope. Look at verses 24 and 25 in the book of Romans, chapter number 8. I want you to look at what they say. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now, when we talk about hope, in the scripture, the word hope has a little different meaning than what maybe you would think hope means. If, if I was, let me back up for a second. No, yeah, yeah, I'll do it this way. If I was to ask some of, some of your friends, not you, I know, but some of your friends, if I was to say to them, when, when, when you die, are you going to heaven? A lot of them, they say, I hope so. Yeah. You hear a whole lot of doubt in that word hope. There's a lot of questions and, and, and variables that, that seem to cast uh, the possibility that it will not materialize. Well, when we talk about hope in the scriptures, there is no doubt in hope. And that's what I want to get across to you today. We're going to talk about that and I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, a lot of times folks say, I hope so, or I'm, I'm hoping this will happen, and all of those things. And, they, and in that, they are, uh, they're conveying the doubtfulness and the, uh, the fears that they have that it will not come to pass. But our hope is not as their hope. Amen. And I'm, I'm going to explain that to you this morning. Uh, this says we're saved by hope. And, uh, and you say, Brother Buddy, you've always taught us that we can know that we've been saved. But this says that we hope we're saved. No, it doesn't say we hope we're saved. It says we're saved by hope. And I want to explain to you that hope. we got to look here. Uh, and in these verses, uh, tells us that what we have has not yet been delivered. Can I show you this again? It says we're saved by hope, but it's that but hope that is seen is not hope. If we already had our if we already had the fulfillment of our salvation, if the promise was already given, then there would be no hope. We would call it salvation. We would call it uh, eternal life. He says we're saved with hope, uh, but what a man seeth, why he don't need to hope for anything. But we if we hope for that that we see not, then we would patience wait for it. We are today. The product of waiting on the fulfillment of the promise. Does anybody remember a promise that Jesus made before he went away? That he's coming back again. I got to go to the Father, he said. If I go away, I'll prepare a place for you. If I prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. The blessed promise is that Jesus is returning. We haven't got that yet. We're waiting on that. But we have his promise. And so that's why it's called a hope. We've got our hope in the fact that he told us something that will come to pass. The reason it's called hope is because we're resting on God's promises until the time that Jesus returns to redeem us and fulfills that promise. But our hope is not because of doubt or unbelief. It is because of confidence. Our hope is actually a term of confidence. When I say my hope is in Jesus Christ, I'm saying my confidence is in Jesus Christ. I may not yet have received what he's promised, but I believe that his promises are true. That confidence that I have in him, can I just say this to you this morning, is placed in one who cannot fail. My confidence is placed in one who cannot fail. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6, if you'll flip over there real quickly, I want to show you this. Starting in verse number 13, here's the main meat of the message this morning. 
this concept's not brand new. This concept was given back to uh, Abraham. Now here he's called Abram. Oh, actually, he's called Abraham here. I apologize. Um, but back when uh, Abraham uh, received the covenant from God, he got a promise. And I want to share with you what went on. In verse 13, you guys there? For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Now, a lot of people, they'll, when they swear, they'll swear on their mama's grave or they'll swear, on, um, uh, swear to God, you know, that this is what I'm telling you is true. And God uh, can't swear on a higher power than what he is. So he just, he just made, a, he made his oath based on who he is. And he said, uh, I, uh, I promise you and I swear to it. Uh, according to himself. So he said, um, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. He's talking to Abraham, who is um, uh, not able to bear children because his wife Sarah is barren. And God's promising Abraham he's going to make a great nation out of his seed. So, and so after he had patiently endured, you might need to highlight that in your Bible, those two words patiently endured after Abraham waited on God. Now Abraham was given the promise when he was like 75 years old. When was Isaac born to him? When he was 100 years old. How about that? You talk about somebody having to be patient. So after he had patiently endured, what did he do? He obtained the promise. It came. God said so. God kept his promise. In fact, I would challenge any scholar in here today to go through the scriptures and find one place where God's ever made a promise and not kept it. Can't find it. Ain't in there. He obtained the promise after he patiently endured. He waited. For men verily, this is verse 16, men verily swear by the greater. They try to choose a power greater than themselves. I already mentioned that to you. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. And when somebody will do that, if somebody will give you some kind of a swear or, a, or somebody will give you an um, um, a earnest a deposit, somebody will, will do something that will show that they're really, really, really telling you the truth, it takes away all the anxiety and anticipation away from you. You go like, I know he's coming back because... He swore to me, or he gave me this token of his oath and his promise. And so I know he's going to do what he said he's going to do, so I'm not worried about it. That's what men do. So God not only promised, but he also swore, and he gave the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation or for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. It puts people to rest. Wherein God willingly more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability, that means the unchangeableness of his counsel or what he determined to do, he confirmed it by an oath. What that verse says, real simple in common language, is God promised Abraham and then he swore to him he'd keep the promise. That's simply all it says. So that Abraham could rest, and not only Abraham, but his descendants could rest assured in the promise that God will do what he said he will do. Verse 18, that by two immutable things, that's the unchangeableness I talked about earlier, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. The two immutable things are the fact that God always keeps his promise. It's his promise and his oath. Those things cannot change. Listen to me for just a second. If you miss everything else, you can go back to sleep. Everything's cool. Listen. If God promises you, he cannot back up on it. If God swears it to you, it never will change. It will come to pass. He cannot change it. I'm not saying that he won't want to back up on it. I'm telling you, he cannot change it. Scripture says he's the God that cannot lie. Amen. He can't tell you something and not do it. Right. Please understand that. 
And he's told us if we place trust in the finished work of Calvary's sacrifice, Jesus Christ, on that tree and his blood sacrifice for our sins, he said, you put your faith in that, you shall be saved. That's what he said. He promised it. And Jesus, when he went away, said, hey, I'll come back and I'll get you. I'm not leaving you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And his promises are unchangeable, immutable. He can't back up. I don't know if this is getting to you like it needs to or not, but you can rest assured. I think I read one of the verses in there, a verse or two back that said uh, that men find uh, some kind of a, a ceasing from strife whenever they get that kind of an oath or a promise or somebody swears to them. It says it's a confirmation to them and end of all strife. Men can rest because they have received a, 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 a promissory note or a swearing or a, some type of a, a down payment and, and so they hold on to that so they don't worry no more. Child of God, hear me today. I am not worried. The world could go to hell in a handbasket. I'm not worried about it. I don't care about who sits on the, the throne in the White House uh, because I'm going to God's house. I, I'm going to do my best to vote as, as responsible as possible, but I'm not going to despair. I'm telling you today, it doesn't matter what the price of gas, bread, or milk goes to. God's in control. And he cannot fail. He's made promise to never leave us and never forsake us. You know what that does for me? That gives me an end of strife. I don't struggle anymore. I don't fret about it. I know people tell me all the time how much you pay for gas. I say, I don't know. I just stop and fill her up. I don't know. I don't, what am I going to worry about it for? It ain't going to make it come down a nickel. I can stand there and go like, oh, it's too much, it's too much. I'd say, no, get out of the way so somebody can fill it up then. Anyway, you can't change it. Uh, you, no matter how high the groceries go or the light bill goes, my goodness, the light bills, uh, I, all of those things. You can't, you can't do nothing about that. No matter how wicked the world may get, and oh my goodness, it looks like Sodom and Gomorrah today in our hearts. We know that there's, there's such wickedness and perversion everywhere you look today, but my friend, you can't fret over that. There should be an end of all strife. There's a wonderful peace that comes into the heart of the children of God, knowing this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm looking for the day when he fulfills the promise and comes back. And the hope that is not seen today, one day will be seen, but then I can't call it hope no more. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what these verses are written to. And Abraham was given a promise that he'd be the father of a great nation. Well, it happened in the, in the nation of Israel, but it also happened in the nation of all believers. All men who come into Jesus Christ by faith become the children of Abraham. It's just the way God planned it. So whenever this, these verses talks about how the promise was made to Abraham, it says that God, he was willing, in verse 17, wherein God willingly, more abundantly, to show unto the heirs. It, God wanted to make sure that you had assurance. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. Outside of salvation, the greatest gift I believe that a person ever receives besides salvation is the assurance of their salvation. It's being saved and know it. Being settled with it. And God's willing, willing more abundantly to show into the heirs of the promise, that's us, how unchangeable, immutable his counsel is his determination, his, his, uh, his uh, proclamation of our salvation, that how he's not going to change it, he confirmed it by an oath. God did that so that you wouldn't worry. When you wake up every day worried that God might kick you out or maybe you're not saved, it may be because you haven't trusted in the finished work of Calvary. You haven't put your faith in a God that said, I'm going to do it. And if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. 
and, and it should put you to peace and to rest. God wants you to be at peace concerning your soul's destiny. God did that. He willingly did that. He went far and beyond what he needed to do in order to make sure that it puts you at rest. Then, uh, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation. You, can, you have strong assurance or confidence. Who have fled for refuge, that's us who run to Jesus, we lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. That hope is not doubt. That hope is confidence. We lay hold on the hope that is set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This hope is the anchor of our soul. Now notice what happens with the anchor. Both sure and steadfast. It shall not be moved. And which entereth into that veil. Which entereth in. To, uh, that entereth into that within the veil, I should say, which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The last two verses in layman's terms is like this. Jesus Christ is our anchor. He's sure and steadfast. He has went somewhere that we could not go he went into the veil. He went into the Holy of Holies. Into the presence of the holiness and the righteousness of God the Father. And he went there for us. Look at verse 20. He went there um, for us. Whether the forerunner, Jesus, is entered for us. And he becomes our high priest. He goes into the holy place that we can't go. Now, this is the picture that's in my mind, and I don't know if I can draw it to you or not, but I, 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 I like to fish, and I used to have a boat, and this is, this is what you do with the anchor. Wherever the boat's at, the anchor ain't right there. If the boat's going to be secure, the anchor's going to have to be considerable distance ahead of where the boat's sitting up against the current or the tide. My understanding that even, uh, especially uh, even today, but especially in, in older times when large ships could not come into maybe shallow harbors and storms would rage, a smaller boat would go out and get the anchor and would bring that anchor into that shallower harbor and would drop that anchor into a secure place in that harbor so that even though that larger ship was sitting outside the harbor and may have to face the, the waves and the storm as it would batter against it, it wasn't worried about going anywhere because the anchor was secure in the harbor. And this is what I want to point to you. Jesus Christ, our anchor of our soul, has gone into the holiest place the, before the mercy seat of an almighty God and he is the one that is standing there making intercession for us. He goes before the, the mercy seat of God. He's into the holy place, some place we can't go. And he is anchored. He's our anchor. He holds us in there. We're tied to him. I can't go in there. He goes for me. He represents me. I've preached to you several times now how that we're saved on the basis of the relationship we have with the Son. It's not me. I'm not made righteous. He's righteous. He's sure and he's steadfast. He's unchangeable. He never will ever lose favor with the Father. And as long as I'm hooked to him, neither will I. Amen. Yes. And I'm secured to him. My rest, my hope is in that anchor that's hooked into the solid rock, Jesus Christ. And he's, got, he's taken me into that place where I now have right fellowship with an almighty God. God promised it and he sealed it with an oath. He swore. And by two unchangeable things, because he is God who cannot lie, Jesus is our hope. Therefore, our hope is him. Not in him, but our hope is him. My hope ain't just in Jesus. My hope is Jesus, who is as an anchor for our soul, who has entered into the holiest of holies, 
to represent us to the Father as our high priest. Wonderful, wonderful verses. This is what makes us children of the Most High God. There's a song that goes like this. It says, in times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one, be very sure, listen, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. It's important for you to know. In whom you have believed. It's not important to know that you believed. It's important to know in whom you have believed. A lot of people believe today. Some people believe they're okay that aren't okay. They're basing it on the wrong stuff. If you ever witness the people, you run into them all the time. I got saved, but bless God, you know, I was... Two years old when it happened, and I ain't even lived for God, and I'm only 89 right now. You know, you wonder. You wonder. What are they basing it on? Where's the faith placed? Their faith is placed on the faith. Mama had them baptized as a baby or something? What's the deal? Faith is great, but it must be placed in the right. Your anchor needs to hold and grip the solid rock. The one that never changes, the one that takes us into the holy place and gives us right standing before a righteous and a holy God. You can believe all kinds of stuff. There's nobody on the earth today hardly that has, in my personal opinion, that demonstrates their faith any better than the radical Muslims. Am I right? They're willing to give their life for what they believe. What they believe is wrong. They don't have their trust put in Jesus Christ. And those that give their lives for, the, for acts of terrorism to, in order to somehow secure themselves some kind of reward in eternity end up finding out that they've spent all of that energy and that time and that devotion to a God who can't help them whenever they leave this world and they wake up in torments, being in hell. It's a, so just having faith is not enough. Being committed to your faith is not enough. You better make sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. It does matter what you believe. It does matter in whom you put your trust. A lot of folks in the Baptist church are hooked to their pastors. And the pastor slips and falls and they quit going. I ain't going no more because they ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. That ain't going to help you none. You got to make sure that you put your anchor in the solid rock. Amen. I'm talking about Jesus this morning. This has nothing to do with the church and nothing to do with your pastor. I'm talking about the one who hung on Calvary's cross, shed his blood, made the sacrifice for your sins so that you could have right standing with the holy God. There's no substitute for that. you got to have him. Amen. The choir can't substitute. Some people, I go to that church because I like the choir. Man, you better wake up and like the one the choir's singing about. Amen. Amen. You need to make sure that your, your confidence is placed in Jesus Christ and in him alone. My goodness. 
we sing another song. It's in a songbook. Sometimes we do it as a choir special. It says, uh, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All is sinking sand. Only the solid rock in Christ alone. When the scripture says, I got so many scriptures I wanted to cram, I, I'm going to go to one more. It's going to be in 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to wrap up. There's just two verses there in chapter 5, 8, and 9. We'll be going there in a second. But there's so many scriptures in the Bible that had reference to the fact that we have hope. And when we talk about hope as a believer, our hope is in the personage of Jesus Christ. I want to say this to you. Please hear me plainly because I don't want anybody to misquote me. If Jesus Christ is a fraud, if he is not the one that he said he is, if he's not at the right hand of the Father today, for us, all hope is lost because everything that we put confidence in today is in the trust that Jesus is exactly who he said he is and his sacrifice done exactly what he said it would do. That's where all my eggs are. Everything I'm placing on eternity, I put in that one basket. My hope is in Jesus Christ. Now, is that misplaced? Is it possible that it could fail? Is it possible that I could find myself disappointed and discouraged because Jesus turned out to be a, a fraud? Not at all. The Bible shows us by many infallible proofs. Listen, we call it faith, but bless God, there's so much evidence, it's just barely faith. It's only because you can't see it right now, but there's so much evidence. He is the Son of God. And only people who will not see it. I'm not talking about somebody can't see it. People who will refuse to see it. Only they will reject because it is so evident. So evident. All we have to do is we witness, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we're witnesses for him, all we got to do is tell them the, gold, the old, old story of how Jesus died on the cross for us. When we give them the gospel message, listen, if they reject it, it's not on your head. It's not about you. You tell them about Jesus, and if they will not receive it, it's because they choose to reject. Because the evidence is overwhelming. Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. Pilate knew it. The soldier knew it. The thief knew it. I believe all both of them knew it. One of them rejected. The other accepted. Today, do you know it? Do you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt? Does your anchor hold and grip the solid rock? Because let me tell you something. Storms are going to come. Maybe they'll blow your sails right off the deck. They will rip you apart. They'll beat the boards off the side of your boat. You better be anchored to the solid rock because if you're moving out of your emotions, if you're going just because one day you feel saved, oh my goodness, you better hang on. You're fixing to take a dip. It's a roller coaster ride. If you're saved one day because you hadn't done nothing really, really, really bad, and well, you just better hold on. You're fixing to hit a wall. The thing that keeps me anchored into the place of righteousness is Jesus Christ. He's my hope and my anchor. Here, let me see if I can finish up and let you go home. Verse 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope. Of salvation. We call it the hope of salvation because we haven't received it yet. 
It's still wrapped up in Jesus. But when he comes, I mean, I'm as good as got it. I mean, I'm as good as got it because I know he's going to keep his promise. But the reason you still see this old sin-cursed feller today is because I'm waiting on the change. And brother Tommy Browder did that, didn't he? Waiting on my change, Lord, waiting on my change. He sang that thing. All of my appointed days, I'm waiting on my change. Whether I am in the grave or should I remain. When Jesus steps out on the clouds, I'm waiting on my change. <laughs> oh, verse 9. He said, brother, quit singing and get it over with. For God has not appointed us to rest. Listen, we have put on a helmet, which is the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. By who? By our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm, of him today, let me tell you, of Jesus Christ, I am very confident. I'm not so confident in me, and I certainly don't know about you. You know, I, I'm not... I'm not very confident at all about what men can do. But of him I'm very confident today. And he is my hope. I'm putting all my trust in him. There is no other way. The, the assurance that we have is his promise that I'll return one day to take you with me. That's what we're working on. I'm going to close. Brother Rick's getting a song. Listen to me for a second. Christian people too many times become discouraged because they try. I'm worried about some of our new converts that don't ever come back even to get baptized. Uh, it concerns me because I think sometimes they think that, damn, they're supposed to be like waking up one morning and have a halo that they got to straighten and an angel wings popping out their back. Uh, I think they, they somehow think that all of a sudden they become the righteousness of, uh, uh, of the universe and and, and, and sometimes even after Christians have been in church for umpteen years, people, they, they still uh, judge themselves based on, on who they are. Listen, I'll tell you who you are. You're just a sinner. Saved by the grace of an almighty God, but just a sinner. Yeah, the, good, the only good thing in you is, what, is the Spirit of God that's been indwelt into you by this wonderful transformation. So don't be amazed whenever things slip up on you. You, you need to know that if you don't pay attention and, and hold very tightly to the regiment of God's word and his spirit leadership, you're going to find yourself slipping and sinning more. It's remarkable how far a Christian can go into sin. I'm not telling you that they're lost. I'm telling you that they haven't held the reins. They haven't kept the rope tight to the anchor. It's important that you know today your confidence is not placed in you. If you place confidence in you or your pastor or your Sunday school teacher or your deacons, I'm telling you, you're going to be let down. That's the reason I don't let you come home with me. I don't want y'all to know everything about me. Y'all would be highly disappointed. You would, you would. You'd go like, huh, my preacher leaves his shoes out like that? Uh, you, that's, you'd be so, you'd go like, oh, I thought, I thought he was like up here. He ain't all that up here. He's, he's just a man. Let me go ahead and just help you out. I am just a man. I am just a man who loves Jesus. And I'm so glad to know that in him is my righteousness. But I want you to understand, if you put your faith or your trust in anything, your confidence rests in something else, you're going to become discouraged either by your own actions or by the actions of another. But Jesus will never let you down. He will never let you down. Get your eyes on him. Look to him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Putting all your confidence in him, he will see you through it. The reason I wanted to preach this to you today is because you will get discouraged if you go by the way of religion. But if you anchor into the solid rock, hell itself cannot change your mind. You wake up and know every day, every day, I'm a child of God on the basis of my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
because that's an immutable thing. It means it cannot change. Unchangeable. Please understand that. That's what gets us in. You th that's why we worship Him. Don't you understand? The reason we worship Him is because He is our everything. None of this means anything without Him. If they take Jesus out of it, we might as well turn this into a gambling house or something. It's all resting upon Jesus Christ. And my question for you today is your confidence in Him. Have you placed your trust in Him today? Or are you resting on something else? If you'd stand with me for just a minute, Brother Rick's fixing to sing. Before he does, I want to ask you this question. Many people sit in these pews week by week. Some of you, some of you are aware that you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you are aware of it. Others may be deluded, deceived, and think everything is okay, but some of you literally know from week to week that you don't have it. But your faith is placed in some other thing. It's in your attendance, church attendance, or, and you're striving to do good or intentions to do better next week. And you keep putting that off and you will not, you will not trust him fully. I'm going to remind you today there's only one way to get in and that's through Jesus. It doesn't matter how great your intentions are. My friend today, I urge you don't go out those doors until you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. That there is no other substitute for you but Jesus Christ and him alone. You're not trying to get better. You're not trying to do good because you know that you stumble from day to day. And you recognize that. You need to have your confidence placed in one who is steadfast. Father, I ask you today.